Hi, everybody. It's nice to see all of you here. Um, uh, keeping the energy up, right? Um, uh, I, it's a real honor to introduce uh, Kevin Kwashi. Um, how can we hold spaces in our minds for resisting the lure to become defined by the limitations from mundane, from mundane corrosions to the murderous that others impose on us? How do we keep that interior space tender, distinct from the world, but still open to it? How can we understand the arrangement of this holding as a quiet and quotidian, but nevertheless enormously valuable aesthetic project and a necessary counterpoint to the collective political work that reveals its stakes? <clears throat> These are some of the questions I think are posed by the work of our next speaker, Kevin Kwashi as he engages with the work of 20th century black writers and visual artists and gently limbs their accounts of discovering the imaginative tools for stepping back from the assumption so unconscious it is often hardened into a truth that black people are defined by racist oppression. Uh, Kwashi is professor of English at Brown University. I'm hoping that corresponds to what's there. Yeah, it does. And, uh, and the author of three monographs, Black Women, Identity, and Cultural Theory, Unbecoming the Subject from 2004, The Sovereignty of Quiet, Beyond Resistance in Black Culture from uh, 2012, and a key contribution to the study of the Black interior in dialogue with figures such as Elizabeth Alexander, Christopher Freeberg, and others. And most recently, Black Aliveness, A Poetics of Being from 2021, uh, which received the Pegasus Award for Poetry Criticism from the Poetry Foundation and the James Lowell Prize from the Modern Language <laughs> Association. In these beautifully composed books, sustained in their almost prayer-like tones, quiet modes of careful attention, we can witness an arc of thinking about the desirous work of creating a black world into which artists give us glimpses. In the spirit of, of challenging the orthodoxy, maybe of, of feminist theory, I want to just briefly highlight the loving stress Kwashi often places on femininity. Uh, here I'll just highlight his interpretation of Gwendolyn Brooks's uh, novella, Maud Martha, um, which is at the center of his of, of the sovereignty of quiet. Uh, Kwashi shows us that in this book, a sequence of moments and not a plot, femininity is not the exclusive property of whiteness, or um, nor is it an oppressive identity imprinted on body, bodies designated as female, so they become transparent vehicles for others' desires. Instead, femininity is an aesthetic practice of seeing and arranging ordinary, intimate, and sensuous pleasures, intra-subjective intra encounters, not for the eyes of others, but for Maud Martha herself to see. Maud Martha certainly witnesses evidence that the white world exiles black women from femininity. One scene quite crucially takes place in a beauty shop. But these are assumptions, as Kwashi shows us, Maud Martha thinks about but never fully absorbs and does not react to with an, an assertion that would give these assumptions a definitive visual shape uh, or you know, an object, the status of an, ob uh, an object in the world. And, and there's such an interesting tension in his work between visuality and literary language that I, I, I can't I don't have time to talk about here, but it's so compelling. Kwashi follows the traces of Maud Mars's thinking Maud Martha's thinking as it comes back around to what he describes in the context of Amiri Baraka's work as, quote, the rightness of black being, the possibility of black becoming. Tracing this thinking and its distance from pernicious and ready-made assumptions about another's being is the work of black feminist theory. It points to the overlaps between black, fem to my mind, it points to the overlaps between black feminist writing and the psychoanalytic work of seeing, identifying, and resisting the aggressive fantasies at work in the projective identifications that are racism and sexism, and that, occlu that occlude the singularity of subjectivity, uh, by which I mean what cannot be known about another person. His talk today is titled Thinking Lucille, Thinking Lucille Clifton Thinking, Please join me in welcoming Kevin Quash. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hmm. 
Stay with me. This is one way to pose an object lesson, the poem Nude Photograph from Lucille Clifton's 1991 collection, Quilty. Here is the woman's soft and vulnerable body, everywhere on her turning round into another where. Shadows on her promising mysterious places, promising the answers to questions impossible to ask. Who could rest one hand here or here and not feel whatever the shape of the great hump longed for in the night, a certain joy, a certain, yes, satisfaction, yes. I am stunned by the declarative definitive work that the first word here does in this poem, how that word as a dexis term points to the impossible and precise place of the speaker's beholding, here, not there, here. Dexis in the English language is a word or phrase such as this, that, these, those, now, then, here, that points to the place, time, or situation in which a speaker is speaking. Its denotation changes from one discourse to another. In starting with that directive, the speaker enacts an uncapturable exactness rather than the photograph or any representation rendering the female subject rote, mute, static. Instead, the woman's soft, vulnerable, sorry, the woman's soft and vulnerable body is here. The imprecision and certitude instantiated by here establish the way we're asked to engage the figure of the woman as well as to behold that the figure of the woman is not the woman herself. Notice, for example, how the poem describes the woman's body and her being in language that is resonant of big, biblical magnificence. For one, the idea of an everywhereness that turns around into another where, which echoes the idea of turning worlds in Genesis. Two, the language of great hump. Three, marriage of certainty and uncertainty, the shadows, the promise of answers to questions impossible to ask which is an apt way to describe the mystery of faith. This compounding language of the metaphysical and the theological generates from the material specificity of the woman's body or the figure of the woman's body. As such, Clifton renders here as a vocabulary capable of the biggest questions of being. It is ontological and phenomenological, since we are being presented with the presence of the thing, its phenomena, right down to the ecstatic, elusively clear conclusion, a certain joy, I'm sorry, a certain joy, a certain yes, satisfaction, yes. Notice how astonishingly good and impacting the poetics are, the repetition of certain and yes, Joy as a synonym of satisfaction. The enjambment such that certain is reinforced and undermined by the line break, as in a certain what? Those commas that are temporary definitive dams. How the assuredness of yes is at once bolstering and a little vacuous since it is indexed to something that is hard to indicate. A certain joy, a certain yes. Satisfaction, yes. We are in the rhetorical ter terrain of here, the indexical gorgeousness of precision that is imprecise, feeling that is undeniable and unshareable, belonging exactly to the one who says here, but also belonging differently to the one who bears the same and who dares to try unsuccessfully to find or know the here, but who, it is promised, will find their own here. It's the object lesson of here. And indeed, that word promise, think how regularly the poem's vocabulary evokes the secure insecurity of promise, as in the words shadows, promising, mysterious, promising, questioning, impossible. Clifton exposes a certain uncertainty in the rhetorical context of the word here, laying bare its theological inflection.
Clifton then offers us a new way to look at the act of looking at a photograph or representation of a nude woman, which is a particularly fraught notion in the Western imagination. But she also offers a manner of orienting in time and space in regard to the materiality and immateriality of studying, the precise and vague intensity of here, the puzzle of trying to appreciate something that has force and clarity and that also eludes capture. I could talk about Dexis as it relates to metalepsis. I'm going to bypass that for now. Again, the poem tells us, here is the woman's body, which means that we're watching the body emerge and merge and elide all at the same time, a praxis then for thinking about citing femaleness. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jennifer Nash, for sustaining a space for study. Thank you to the team of people who have worked on this. Thank you to Julie Winmore and Barbara Fosu Samoa. Thank you, Julie, Jazbear, Grace. You have broken my heart with your incredible insight. When I say broken my heart, I mean that the heart, a muscle and metaphor, is ripped into shreds and finds a way back together so it's a little stronger, a little bigger, or differently stronger, differently bigger. Thank you, Kimberly Lamb, for that introduction. Thank you. Thank you to the many of you who have already come up and said hello to me, who've tendered my tender heart. We are here together, called to study, called to orient as best as we can to the difficult world and these difficult days. I hope you're well and safe. It matters to me that you're here. Thank you for being here. Let me swerve into an apology, not just for how abruptly I began without properly thanking colleagues. That was intentional. I wanted to start with Clifton because for me, Clifton is always an unsettling pleasure, but also because I had intended until 48 hours ago to start this talk with a proper engagement of the enduring question of the object of study. And then I realized that that section of the talk would take about 40 minutes to deliver, which is itself an entire talk. So let me ineptly say that throughout this talk, I will be highlighting things that might have been in that talk. They might be signaled and cited on the screen. It's not intended for you to read all of it or capture all of it. I just want as much as possible to put some of it in the room. Here's how I would have started. I would have started to highlight three massive interventions in the idea of the object of study. First, Robin Wiegman's enduring book, Object Lessons. Then I would have moved to Alexander Wihelier's Habeas Viscus. I'm imagining because this is being recorded, if people want access to the slides, they'll be able to find them. And then I would have moved to Jen Nash's Black Feminism Reimagined. What I would have tried to do in each regard is to emphasize distinct aspect, aspects of their explorations and especially of the canon of work they engage to explore those explorations. Then I would have moved to Hortense Spillers, how she makes a case in her 1994 essay, Crisis of the Negro Intellectual, that the figuration an imperative of community shapes a particular trouble for the black creative intellectual. That community becomes the spectral object of black study. That from there, Spillers advocates that as is the case with the musician, the intellectual needs to try to be clear about their instrument and the ego complexity of the where and how and what of their work. And that if one puts this argument next to the one that Hortense Fillers makes across many of her essays, especially Peter's Pan, Eating in the Diaspora, then the idea of locality and the praxis of the intellectual's work happens in sentences and in words, in the way that word work demands a knowing that is not total, but instead is piece by piece and bit by bit. Forgive the ineptness of what I'm trying to do. Of the 22 slides in that lecture that I'm not giving are two quotations from Horton Spillers that I want you to have. The first is this, which comes from Peter's Pans. The puzzle remains. 
how an oxymoron with an actual and material dimension is to be expressed when it lays hold of a cultural semantics rather than a locality of sentences. Even if we grasp a general economy of practices all at once, it can still only be said bit by bit and part by part. The second slide is from Black, White, and in Color, or Learning How to Paint, where she writes, in order to say the not sayable, I must say, must enter the chain of significant differences inscribed by the sentence. Finally, in that lecture, I would have reminded us that though we over-identify Spillers with Mama's baby, Spiller's thinking is also centrally about formalism and deconstructionism, but not in the ways in which those um, practices get deployed in violent ways. That she theorizes at the level and through the sentence, even in Mama's Baby, which is a grammar, she tells us, which starts with four distinct moves on the screen about reading and rhetoric as enactment of materiality. The lecture I'm not giving helps me to establish a context for thinking about Clifton's thinking. Not just her ideas, but the manner of intellection in her poetic. So forgive me for asking you to hold in mind a lecture I didn't give as I proceed. Also hold in mind what I've already said about the poem that I started and this idiom of index indexicality. Let me start again. I've used this phrase, thinking, Lucille Clifton thinking, as a way to explore various questions over the past couple months. Today I want to consider Clifton's manner of thinking object and to suggest some of its implications for beholding a praxis of black feminist criticism. Bear with me as there's still too much condensed in this talk, though what is most important are the Clifton poems. That is, it doesn't matter anything else except being with the Clifton poems. In leaning on the word thinking rather than feeling or some other term, I'm signaling an interest in a particular trajectory, poetics, philosophy, critiques of both, feminist philosophy of mind, and especially deconstructionism. But I'm also noticing that thinking is a process of feeling, and feeling is how a body thinks. That is, I think we have accepted wholesale in ways, the idea that the body and mind is separated. It is not. We ought not accept the lie about ourselves that Enlightenment thinking has brought to us. In brief, then, I'm proposing that Clifton's poetic practice enacts a kind of thinking and that that thinking is theodical. That is, across Clifton's work is a question of gendered being, a question that becomes an object lesson in thinking because of the theodical character of Clifton's poetics. We know theodicy as the theological attempt to reconcile God's omnipotence and benevolence with the persistent existence of evil. But here I mean theodicy as the form rather than the content of thinking. Theodicy as a kind of questioning, a reckoning with the inexplicable an apophatic exploration, if you know that term. I mean theodicy in the way that Clifton's poems open up questioning, how they open up to questioning, how they enact inquiry. This quality lives, this quality lives in the aesthetics of her poems, in the lean of her lines and the everyday of her language, the small localities from which her poems do their poeting. All of these aesthetic capacities undertake a praxis resonant with the puzzlement and breath, even the desperation of theodicy. The very materiality of the poems asks and enact, not just ask, but enact the question, how can we know? Where the query is both about the mystery and inconsistencies of knowing, the ineptness of the vantage points from which the ordinary human subject experiences the world, and also about the approach to the pursuit of knowing, how as in doubt, how as an announcement of manner. How can we know? Again, theodicy, philosophical and theological in its constitution, but also an enactment or praxis 
for thinking and living, as in how to bear, as in how to bear the bare worldness of living intersected with imagining, with world making and unmaking, where you have nothing to hold on to, no nationalism, no fidelity, no belonging, no one coming to rescue you, something like the open boat abyss in Glissant's work, the awe and awful freight of love in Baldwin and Morrison, the infinity of theological beginning and ending, how to bear bare worldedness. More ineptness, very quick gloss, which is to acknowledge some of the citations. First to say that I'm interested in a, the a cohort of theological thinking across Morrison's work, Spillers's work, and uh, Patricia Williams's Alchemy of Race and Rice. Then to say that there, I'm also engaged with critiques and suspicions of theology and philosophy in black thought. Then to say I'm also engaged with black womanist theology and its particular considerations of evil. And then to acknowledge that there are, of course, discourses on theology and colonialism, as well as classic and contemporary sources on theodicy. Simply, the point I want to set in place is that the theodical is the disposition of Clifton's poetic thinking. We understudy this poet for her thinking because, I think, she looks like an ordinary, because, I think, she is an ordinary black woman. We understudy her poetic thinking, but I'm interested in that thinking. It's force of knowing and not knowing, an aesthetic where doubt incites intellection, where the apophatic is a praxis for approaching being in the world. That is to say, across 13 collections of poetry published between 1969 and 2008, Clifton produced what I might call a vernacular theodicy or a theodicy in the ordinary. The best I can do to support these claims is to lean on Clifton's poem. Here's the opening poem from that 1991 collection, Quilting. Quilting. Somewhere in the unknown world, a yellow-eyed woman sits with her daughter, quilting. Some other where, alchemists mumble over pots. Their chemistry stirs into science. Their science freezes into stone. In the unknown world, the woman threading together her need and her needle nods toward the smiling girl. Remember, this will keep us warm. How does the poem end? Do the daughters' daughters quilt? Do the alchemists practice their tables? Do the worlds continue spinning away from each other forever? This poem imagines two worlds, two scenes of beginning. One, a world of domestic making, and one, a world of scientific magic. Neither scene is marked specifically by the language of nation or state or colony or road, just simply somewhere and some other where. As such, the spatiality of quilting seems to be of the sky. We are in the terrain of the cosmos, or at least a terrain of the ordinary, so ordinary that it is of the cosmos. And this spatiality, this geographic habitat that conjures a quilting woman and her daughter as out of time and in the sky, this spatiality makes it possible to recognize and recognize the everyday black domestic as happening in a register that is also skyward and heavenly. What I mean is that across the collection, Clifton poses questions of gendered being through scenes situated cosmologically, through scenes of biblical Eden, and through the specificity of scenes in museums and cemeteries, through the particularity of bedrooms and doorways and kitchens and sidewalks of black life. What I mean to say is that she merges all of these scenes. Here are two idiomatic examples, though in my slides I have hidden another 17 because ridiculously I thought I could share 17 poems in five minutes. <laughs> This is a poem that is untitled, which goes by the first line somewhere. Somewhere, some woman, just like me, tests the lock on the window in the children's room, lays out tomorrow's school clothes, sets the table for breakfast early, finds a pen between the cushions on the couch, 
sits down and writes the words, good times. I think of her as I begin to teach the lives of the poets about her space at the table and my own inexplicable life. I'm struck by the locality of space, the specificity here, broadened by the idiomatic use of somewhere, the tracking of space in the poem, revealing a kind of expanse rather than what we might think of as only a domestic smallness, the everyday precarity refracted and amplified and scaled both to the human and of, that word again, space. I'm struck by the word inexplicable, enhancing the philosophical dimensionality of this somewhere and this woman. Clifton uses the word inexplicable. We saw in the earlier poem the word impossible. She uses these words to accentuate, I think, a philosophical character to what might look like the small and everyday ordinary domestic scene of black gendered life. Here's another poem. Just I'm trying to give you three poems that indicate the ways in which um, gender is being ideated across space uh, in the collection. Eve thinking. It is wild country here. Brothers and sisters coupling claw and wing, groping one another. I wait while the clay two foot rumbles in his chest, searching for language. To call me, but he is slow. Tonight, as he sleeps, I will whisper into his mouth our names. There's so much to say about what Clifton does with Eve, but I will save that for yet another talk that I won't give today. Um, I'm struck here by the disruptive relation made by line and stanza breaks, even in the midst of sonic affinity between wild, coupling, claw, wing, groping. The W's and the I-N-G sounds and the C's across those words. The question made in the indexical word here at the very beginning of the poem, what world is this? Is Eve inside Adam, as in rumbles in his chest? A later poem will reform and revise the Eve comes from Adam idiom. So hold this in mind when I come to that poem. I'm struck too by the incredible mixed sensory idiom where a kiss becomes a whisper, where speech passes into another's mouth. There's something at stake here in this um, Edenic rendering of a female announcing subjective being. My dears, all I'm trying to do is to point out that the geography of quilting in this collection generates localities that merge and confuse and elevate and escalate everyday happenings such that this world and another world are sutured together. All I'm trying to do is to suggest that Clifton iterates quilting a black domestic, maybe even a feminine textile practice as the texture by which we might understand worldedness. Moreover, Clifton's poems make a tapestry of localities where gendered existence offers a meditation on beginning and ending, where the everydayness of gender is also a discourse of the heavens, of Genesis, and of apocalypse. Again, look at the two worlds noted in quilting. Notice how the clean rhythm of the first stanza becomes stilted in the second stanza, which is the result of the interference of enjambment and seishura and repetition. Notice that this wonky entanglement in the second stanza reflects an attempt, an attempt to solidify scientific knowing, even as the scientific is despite itself, alchemical or of magic. Indeed, notice that both worlds are about making, and the scientific one is described by domestic nouns and verbs, mumble, pots, stirs, freezes. Notice, too, the terrific impossible mixed metaphor, where stone displaces ice, a happening that is too fantastical for enlightenment rigidity. If this poem travels from a scene of human doing toward a clash between that doing and enlightened modes of understanding, then it is a clash that hasn't been resolved yet. 
or better said, the speaker in Clifton's poems, is determined to use the everyday, the celestial, the alchemical, and the mythical all together to constellate an ideation of female being and beginning. One more thing. Notice how the phrase daughters, daughters, rescripts the genealogy of relation so that there isn't a hierarchy of mother, daughter. It is a kind of sly, temporal, and cosmic move where the relation is leveled to the level of being a daughter, being born female, or being born to someone. And here I have to acknowledge an undergraduate student of mine, Jared Set, for it was a late December conversation as Jared was struggling to finish work, um, where we came together in this understanding of this in interesting phrase, daughters, daughters. This poem that ends in openness is an inquiry that is sustained by the collection's second poem. And I'm going to read the second poem, but for the sake of time, I, I don't think I'm going to um, read what I was going to say about it, maybe. This poem is also untitled, so it goes by its first line, I am accused of tending the past. I'm accused of tending to the past as if I made it, as if I sculpted it with my own hands. I did not. This past was waiting for me when I came, a monstrous unnamed baby. And I, with my mother's itch, took it to breast and named it history. She is more human now, learning language every day, remembering faces, names, and dates. When she is strong enough to travel on her own, beware, she will. Oh, I'm annoyed with myself for having to. I, one could talk about the, I, I'm not going to talk about <laughs> fantasy world. One could talk about the use of the present tense, the I am accused, which means the accusation is continuous, not complete. One could talk about the as if, the vernacular, and the subjunctive. Um, I was going to talk about this moment of slippage here, indexical slippage, where it's hard to know if the pronoun it refers to history or refers to the one who's mother in it. And that slippage compounds some fantastic thing. But in the interest of time, because I know we're on a schedule, I'm just going to point, point those things out. Another lecture I'm asking you to hold that I didn't give. Clifton, then, I hope you can see, thinks about the making of the universe. I don't mean she thinks, sorry, I said that wrong. Clifton thinks the making of the universe. I don't mean she thinks about the making of the universe, but that she thinks it. She thinks the making of the universe, and her thinking temporalizes gendered being and gendered spatiality as scenes of apocalyptic infinity. Um, at the end of the talk, um, while we're waiting for people to gather questions, I will just throw up and read two more poems, because I've tried to stuff too much into this. So I've already choreographed my own extra session at the end of the talk that will point to the thing about apocalyptic infinity. This enactment figures through ordinary localities, what I'm calling a theodical myth of the world and the heavens that hosts a black female daughter or mother or daughter as mother, a black gendered query that is mapped in the blue black of space. And in this moment, I want to go back to this incredible moment in this poem, somewhere the speaker intones, some woman just like me tests the lock on the window in the children's room. And suddenly, one understands the capaciousness of the somewhere and that some woman. Some, suddenly, the diction, somewhere and some woman, which seems ordinary, even non-poetic diction. It seems as if it is not poetic, given the ways in which we think of the, about the poetic, poetic having a particular register. Suddenly, this diction arrives as an occasion for thought. Suddenly, we understand the collection's deployment of the quilt form as a rubric for knowing and reckoning, reckoning and mysticism. Suddenly, the somewhere and the some woman becomes precise, particular, and infinite. More things I'm going to bypass on, which is to say that one could talk about Sylvia Winter's work on man and the world as a descriptive statement. One could also talk about um, ideations of futurity. But instead, what I most want to say is that in Clifton's um, deployment of myth, I think she's enhancing 
transatlantic slavery as the singular discursive origin for thinking about black being. That is, if we want to think about black beginning, often transatlantic slavery becomes a horizon point. And in Clifton's incorporation of Eden and the cosmological, she might be proposing other coordinates for ideating an open and always beginning of blackness. Clifton's myth-making is a theodicy that thinks about the body, the trouble of the body, and even the black female body specifically for, for feminist theory, which is why I have emphasized the, sorry, which is why I've emphasized the idiomatic phrase gender at the beginning of the world. If gender differentiates and marks the beginning and ending of worldedness, as in the poem Quilting, then Clifton is theorizing first femaleness. That is, in Eve, in the ordinary black protagonists across the book, Clifton poeticizes female origin not as a biological essence of the body, but as a becoming through the body. I mentioned Eve and the black women protagonists across the book, but in Clifton's poems, there's also Lucifer and Adam and people who are gendered male or gender non-binary. I want to be clear I want to be clear that Clifton is deliberately offering ideations of femaleness, representations that amplify the myth of femaleness. I mean that word myth in at least two registers, but maybe more than that. As such, the poetic encounter with the implied question, what is black femaleness, avoids the fallacy of a single essential answer. The question, what is black femaleness, becomes theodical. It becomes a kind of philosophical provocation that doesn't disavow the material specificities of black female subjects. Across the book, there are probably 19 or 20 specific black female subjects named and located and indicated in the poems. So it doesn't deny or disavow the material specificities, but becomes still an occasion to figure black female subjectivity through the ages of myth which is to say it figures black gender subjectivity through the agents of myth, as if we're trying to understand the plural form of gendered being. Said another way, Clifton's poetics negotiates the trouble of the body in feminist and women's and black studies, a trouble that includes mis-evidencing a black female body as the antonym of the human, thereby indexing black femaleness to a trap of flawed embodiment, and as a result, inducing a kind of possessive normative logics about bodily integrity as the size of, of liberatory discourse. As seductive as possessiveness as liberation might seem, some tenets of black feminism rightly surpass this ease. Here are some iconic examples that we might understand where even um, seminal black feminist texts um, are refusing in the title, all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave, the shift away from an identity name, or this incredible irony in the Company uh, uh, River Collective's decline away from essentialism. As black women, we find any type of biological determinism. As black women, we find any kind of biological determinism, which is asking us then to not understand black women as a biologically determined category. It's brilliant. Clifton's thinking understands the body via a shape-shifting mysticism, a myth of femaleness where the body is presented in parts or in radical transformation, as if the body is being formed and reformed. Across the collection, she has po poems to her uterus, to menstruation, to cancer, to menopause, just to give you examples. For Clifton, if the body, varyingly imminent and transcendent, if the imminent and transcendent body is a kind of sacrament, it is such as a source of thinking and knowing, it is flesh as the problem for thought, or as Toni Morrison writes it, the body as the vehicle, not only the point, not only the singular possessive point. Here's where I want to call out my colleague, um, uh, Marina Maglore, whose last name I think I might be mispronouncing slightly, who in, whose recent book, We Pursue Our Magic, writes of Lucille Clifton, um, emphasizes the primacy and specificity of the black woman's body as a site of spiritual encounter, even as she, Clifton, complicates the notion 
of black feminist embodiment by presenting the black woman's body as one transitory incarnation among many. My glory goes on to say Clifton adopted a very ethereal take on the human body. I'm trusting that many of us in here know some of the many names and things on another inept slide. I, all I'm trying to do is to give some gesture to the incredible indebtedness I have for thinking with a generation of people who've been thinking and talking around these issues. And I'd rather um, uh, signify this in this way, inept though it may be, so that I can spend time with four Clifton poems to try to um, establish some of what I've suggested about the theodical the the apparatus of Clifton's working. So four poems, and then a couple more in slides, and then I'll end, and then I'll share two more poems. <laughs> <sighs> First the poem, Fat, Fat, Water Rat. Imagine the children singing to a thin woman. Imagine her tight lips, the shadow and bone of her ass as she enters this room and you see her and whisper, beautiful. Imagine she is myself, next year perhaps, passing the now silent children, entering this room and you, not recognizing the water rat, feel your tongue thickening, everything thickening. In my dream, I swim away from her as often as toward. In my dream, the children are singing or silent, it never matters. And I am of uncertain size and shape, lying splendid in a giant's bed. Imagine this room and me spreading for you my thighs, my other beautiful things. In this poem, where the act of seeing, the magical act of re-seeing is consummated with the narrative act of the speaker, such that word becoming body, becoming one made anew through the word. That is, the speaker throws the image of her past self, maybe her now self, into the narrative, such that the invocation to imagine is what the speaker herself does. The speaker's body is reformed by the act of speaking about and imagining her body. The material and the immaterial are being rendered as a praxis here, where a black female speaker resides in and beyond her body, or in and beyond a body that is and is not hers. In and beyond a body that is and not the body given to her by the children, the body being given to her by this partner who is seeing it, the body being given to her by the praxis of imagining that's enacting all of that. There's more I could say about this poem, but we're also on time. Think then this poem, the iconic poem in praise of menstruation. If there is a river more beautiful than this, sorry, start again. If there is a river more beautiful than this bright as the blood red edge of moon. If there is a river more faithful than this returning each month to the same delta. If there is a river braver than this, coming and coming in a surge of passion, of pain. If there is a river more ancient than this, daughter of Eve, mother of Cain and of Abel. If there is in the universe such a river, if there is somewhere water more powerful than this wild water, pray that it flows also through animals beautiful, and faithful, and ancient, and female, and brave. In this poem, where the fluid of menstruation, which is an inside-outside materiality of and not of the body, at least the normative way in which we understand the body, menstruation is used, bless you, to reimagine that classic black poetic image, the river, where menstrual blood initiates an epic conceptualization of the universe such that bodily fluid equates with world formation. Notice also that the poem's cosmology turns on two rhetorical flourishes. First, of the repeated subjunctive condition, which casts the achievement of fluid river world female as not yet arrived, like a spell. And second, on an incomplete syllogism at the end, 
the implied as at the end of the poem, as in pray that it flows also through animals, beautiful and faithful and ancient and female and brave as. Of course, the implied syllogism matches the, ex the extended metonym of blood and river and water, all of which are inferring something about femaleness, inferring and asserting a kind of animal femaleness, which might not be the same thing as woman. Hold that idea um, for, this next, for the poem after this next one. Though I should say Clifton also has in the collection a poem called Wishes for Sons, in which she wishes for sons that, uh, that they could give birth, that they would have menstrual cycles. So that I want us to be clear that f from this one poem, this is not a reinstantiation of something essentialist. Oh, the birth of language. Oh my God, this poem. An Adam Rose, fearful in the garden, without words for the grass his fingers plucked, without a tongue to name the taste, shimmering in his mouth. Did they draw blood, the blades? Did it become his early lunge toward language? Did his astonishment surround him? Did he shudder? Did he whisper, Eve? If we had all day, where we might notice Adam becomes manifest as a virgin via that particular idiomatic function of blood here. Adam bleeds. And also, Adam is the one who's given birth. He, he's both given birth and he's the one who's being born. Adam then becomes both the unformed being and the one who's bearing or making material, the unformed. It is a kind of ecstatic refiguring that is nearly visualized in this singular gorgeous move from lunge to language. Notice how those words lined up. Notice that lunge and language are synonyms of each other. Watch lunge expand to become language as if lunge lunges into language. Clifton is out of her damn mind. These <laughs> erotics, these erotics mark Adam via his body and via astonishment, which is a different iteration of his giving rise. Notice the verb rose, the noun and verb rose in the um, beginning of the poem. So it's a different iteration of his giving rise to Eve. And finally, Peeping Tom. Uh, I should say Peeping Tom uh, comes right after pr um, poem in praise of menstruation in the sequence of the collection. Sometimes at night, he dreams back 30 years to the alley outside our room where he stands, a tiptoed boy watching the marvelous thing, a man turning into a woman. Sometimes, beating himself with his own fist into that spilled boy and the imagined world of that man, that woman, that night, he lies turned from his natural wife. Sometimes, he searches the window for a plaid cap two wide eyes. Uh, there is, I'm only going to say a couple things here, but the, that man, that woman, that night, no punctuation, it's astonishing, okay? Um, Clifton's Peepin' Tom revises the idiom of falling from grace, as it also revises the notion of woman made of man. Here in this poem, the young boy is watching a magical, called marvelous, act of sex, where a man and a woman are rolling around, where to his young eyes, where to the view, the, maybe the not quite full view he has, a man turns into a woman, where the word turns means become, as it also means enters or rolled over into. The word turns has this kind of revolutionary potential of transubstantiation. Think back to the two worlds spinning in regards to each other. He, the peeping child, has a revelation and comes into a new level of knowing that this is sex, that sex is the body transformed from one thing into another. Not one discrete person and another discrete person, but one thing turning into another, a kind of metamorphosis. And as such, a crude, even puerile, youthful moment arises a kind of holy scene of gender doing and undoing as diction and imagery conspire to reform the trope of Eve coming from Adam's rib, 
to demand that we understand what it might mean for a man to turn into a woman. Surely something is being disrupted about the natural rules of adult gendered being, that word natural imported from the phrase, he lies turned from his natural wife, never mind the word lies. The revelation here then of seeing and longing for this radical re embodiment, disembodiment, hyper embodiment, where the body transformed from one thing into another, which is to say that all over Clifton's poems are these moments where femaleness is central to becoming, which is to say that one might frame it, frame it as femaleness emerges, but it might be better to frame it as from femaleness another being emerges, which is to say that this is to understand the idea of birth differently not birth as we index it in our normative language, but birth in an ideological manner where something can emerge and become anew from this world horror we understand. I know I'm moving quickly, and I also know that I should move a little more quickly. Um, I should have advanced those slides, um, forgive me. Part of what I'm trying to suggest is this thing of the, the necessary cautions about possessiveness and about um, uh, disciplinary field formation that scholars, some of them cited here, um, have asked us to be aware of. The narrow limits of a kind of black feminist theory, um, as, as I think we all understand. Um, let me jump ahead then to say, um, that in addition to the scholars I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, Alexander Haley, Robin Wiegman, Horton Spills, and Jen Nash, that there are also other scholars who thought about this idea of the object of study, who are regularly asking us to think about the kind of disciplinary limitations of how we do our work. And I, I, I think uh, today, um, in Julie's talk especially, is not so much to ask us to become experts in fields in which we're not familiar, but it's to recognize that we kind of need all of the knowledges and we need to be accountable to all of what our knowledge practices are asking us to try to behold about the world that many of us are trying to engage, survive, and maybe transform. So a quick, more inept swerve to say that there are three talks embedded in here. One of them is about Poetic, the poetic is a form of thinking, which is to say that Plato was wrong about poetry, but that's a whole other <laughs> argument. Um, then there's also a talk about the kind of outsized role that writing plays in black intellection. And when I say writing, I don't only mean writing. I'm thinking of uh, writing as an apparatus for thinking in the way that Horton Spillers talks about the sermon, um, the congregants in the sermon, I'll say this in a minute uh, better, the congregants in the sermon as readers of the sermon, not just passive receptors, right? So where the agency of the sermon is not with the one who's given the sermon, but with the people who are hearing it, understanding it, which she calls reading, because reading is a way of deciphering and thinking a thing that the human does. So that talk is also there. And then third is a talk about reading and criticism and thinking, my attempt to re-engage a kind of what I'm thinking of as a black feminist deconstructionist practice. Um, not a recuperative project, but a, a project that's trying to think about and understand something about criticism now. I've jumped ahead enough that I want to take a second and figure out where I am so that I can say this last thing clearly and read you the last poem in the talk. Hmm. Yeah, I think I can do this. I'll keep this up, that this is just another citational slide. That is, this is just to say that across the work I'm doing, um, I'm thinking about aesthetics and criticism and the limits of aesthetics. I'm thinking about close reading and formalism and new criticism. I'm thinking about thinking. I'm thinking about distinctions between critique and criticism. I'm thinking about questions of distance in black critical practice, and then the issue of orality and orality in the black text. In brief, I might say that I'm interested in black criticism, in being and thinking with black art. I'm interested in the ambivalence and distance, the intimacy that criticism requires, as Anne Ducille reminds us, in its unyielding pleasures, as Roland Barth reminds us. I'm interested in the idea that criticism produces both a kind of estrangement 
and maybe that the estrangement is all the consolation there is. That the critic is not a specialized figure, but a reader, an ordinary reader, like Horton Spiller's theorizes of the sermon. I think I've just quickly glossed that for you, but people can ask me during the Q&A if they want. A reader versed in the intelligence of the thrall of encounter with the word. I'm trying to apprehend the way that Spiller's establishes the critical practice as a black practice, and that critical practice being connected to thinking deeply about reading, about word work, like Baby Suggs in The Clearing in Toni Morrison's novel Beloved, when she tells the people to sing, weep, dance, laugh, touch. She's asking them to think, like Patricia Williams writing a diary that tries to imagine rights beyond the discourse of sovereignty. I'm trying, I'm speaking from anxiety and trying to show some of my work Simply, I want to tell you that I'm interested in how we do criticism now and how criticism is an, act, is an act of thinking. I'm compelled by thinking with Clifton, and thinking with Clifton helps me get there. But I want to be clear, it is not that I revere Clifton's work. It is not that because I'm black and Clifton is black that I feel a kinship with the work. That might be a piece of it. It is more that the work unsettles me, exposes to me how much distance there is between me and its work, between me and its fine thinking, between me and my working to apprehend its work, between me and the thing I think I want in the world by doing this work. I don't want to be consoled with the fiction that I know Clifton. Mm. Fiction is the wrong word. I don't want to be consoled with the violence of thinking that I know Clifton. I want to be caught with the reminded labor of trying to stay with the practice of navigating that distance. That might be the best we can do in the human project, is navigate the distance between us and between the idea of the world we hope to make, which is why deconstruction is um, reading practice and its engagements of distance and ambivalence can be useful to me. But I don't only have to travel through deconstruction, and certainly I don't have to only travel through the, um, through the iconic canon of understood theories of deconstruction, because all of the people indicated on the slide are also people who are engaged in deconstructionist practice. All right, one more short paragraph and a poem, and I'll stop. I should have had that up there, but that's okay. Mm. In the world of reading and thinking that Spillers and Williams authors, criticism is an ordinary common act. It's not a specialized act of the academy. It's not a specialized act of a set of people who work in their studios isolated. It is an everyday act. It is what every reader does, like those congregants of the sermon in Spillers' work surrendering to the lure of words, sinking down into the praxis of discernment. Ordinary in the way that Morrison conceptualizes the reader as a writer, ordinary and necessary and conditioned by the surprise and wonder and unsettledness, the estrangement that aesthetics makes. The surprise and wonder and unsettledness, the estrangement that being human in the world with other people makes. Estrangement and license, as in my favorite poem from Clifton's quilting, a poem about Lucifer. Lucifer, a light bearer, an enlightened and enlightening subject on the make, and as such, a poem that in part is about yearning and clarity and openness, the sheer tender exposedness, about terror and certainty and unknowing, a poem about theodicy, where theodicy might be the practice of the critic, the certain uncertainty, the righteousness of the critic who's a reader, the critic who's an ordinary black reader, which is to say, a poem that I think evidences or inspires something of everything I've said today. Lucifer speaks in his own voice. Sure as I am of the seraphim folding wing, so am I certain of a graceful bed and a soft caress along my long belly at end time. It was to be.
I who was called son, if only of the morning, saw that some must crawl, sorry, saw that some must walk or all will crawl. So slithered into earth and seized the serpent in the animals. I became the Lord of snakes for Adam and for Eve. I, the only Lucifer, light bringer, created out of fire. Illuminate I could, and so illuminate I did. Thank you. <laughs>